everyone, this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. It's my passion to share stories of amazing legal ladies who are working as in-house legal counsel, who have law firm roles, who are leading on boards and who are doing law differently. From time to time, I will also invite special guests on the show to share their insights on legal recruiting and tips for getting hired as a successful lawyer in Japan. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lawyer On Air podcast. In this podcast episode, I will share with you another diverse story of a woman lawyer working in Japan. I'm Catherine, the host of the show, and I'm a lawyer based in Tokyo for 20 years. I love helping unlock the wisdom of the stories that women lawyers never tell. What I've learned in my career in law so far is when you meet good people, be it your client or your boss, hold on to them and build a solid network with them. Those are the words of Yui Otabakle, who is my guest today on the Lawyer On Air podcast. Yui is an associate at Norton Rose Fulbright based in Tokyo. She's a transactions lawyer admitted in New York, and she speaks with a little bit of a British accent. She specializes in asset finance with a focus on the shipping and energy sectors. Yui will be telling us about how she was raised in Yokohama, spent one year in Colorado, US, and graduated then from Keio University and took a Master's of Law at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. You can check out Yui's full bio in the show notes. On this episode, Yui shares with us how she viewed being different and a minority in the U.S. as a positive thing, because that meant that others asked her curious questions instead of her having to go and find the courage and be the one to take the first step. She also shares how showing your vulnerabilities is truly important for all people to enable us to flourish. If we only see the successful people on Instagram or in law journal articles, we can't relate to them if we ourselves have stumbled or failed. Yui challenges more lawyers to show their vulnerable side, to empower others, but also make yourself relatable and to stand in failure as your power and strength. You'll also hear how Yui is making the change to a diverse and inclusive future in the area where she lives. And every time she gives out her business card to someone who doesn't want to give their business card to her. This is a very interesting story and thank you Yui for sharing it. She also shares her hot tips on food, travel and a book and a podcast that she loves as well as other fun facts. Well, here goes, and let's get into it. Hello, Yui, and welcome to the show. Hi, Catherine. Thank you very much for having me today. It's a great pleasure. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And, you know, we're at the uh, wine bar, a place where we might choose to go. So if we were meeting up today in person for uh, drinks, where would we be? Do you have a, a favorite wine bar or restaurant or cafe that you like to go to, Yui? And what would be your choice of beverage off the menu today? Okay, so I have two places in mind, but if this were a weekday evening catch up at a bar, then I would choose this bar in Akasaka called Bani. And I choose this place because one, I can't drink alcohol and I also am allergic to tobacco smoking. So this Bani is um, no smoking place and then the bartender and owner Hashi-san he makes the best mocktails I would say in in entire Japan so whether you love alcohol or you can't drink either way you will have the best time. Oh that sounds really nice I I find it very hard to find a place that doesn't just try to ply you with alcohol exactly. and of course I love a wine I love a glass of wine but also it's really nice to go to a place that has mocktails yeah what kind of mocktail do you like I like mocktails using the seasonal fruits 
So I do not go to Barney, you know, thinking about anything particular. I just show up and then ask the bartender to just, you know, can you make me something with the seasonal fruit and just that's it. And then just see what he offers. Ooh, I love that. Is yuzu, what what season is yuzu? Because that's one of my favorites. I think yuzu, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought yuzu was often used towards like the winter. Yeah, autumn, winter, isn't it, I think? Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought. So round about now, I see there's, you know, we're coming into cherry blossom season time and I have seen quite a few sakura cherry blossom cocktails and mocktails around. Is that something that perhaps Hashi-san would deliver up for you now then? Probably. Um, yeah, mm. personally, I have not had that before, but yeah, why not just um, ask for it and then Hashi-san would just um, make the magic happen exactly. to any request. Exactly. Oh, that sounds fun. Try yeah. that. I, I'd love to hear back from you what happened with Hashi-san and the seasonal drink that he might be serving up for you now. That's so cool. Well, Yui, let's go back a little bit further into your earlier days when you were a child or perhaps a young adult. What kinds of careers were you thinking of or dreaming up at that time? I was thinking of being a teacher. I was thinking of being an air hostess. I, oh, was, right. thinking, I was thinking of working in a bookshop. I love the smell of ink and paper. Those were my fantasies. So when I was younger... I have to be honest, I just not really have any particular like occupation or jobs that I really want it to be. I think it's partially because I was in this really strict um, school environment where I was always focusing on studies and exams that were just coming up one after the other. And so I just didn't really have anything special in mind but what I had instead in my mind is that I wanted to do something really professional so that I can be of service to somebody in the world it doesn't have to be a big big client or big population but I just want it to be helpful to somebody so that was sort of a big goal I had when I was younger well that's pretty Awesome, really. I mean, you you can't, how can you know also when you're young what exactly it is, only from perhaps what you might see on TV or someone might talk about it and you hear it. But knowing that you want to be a professional and help people in the world, that's pretty profound, I think. Yes. So thinking back, so I attended this all girls Catholic private school um, in Yokohama called Yokohama Futaba. And then one of their educational sort of principle that they've given applied to all of the pupils was that you definitely have some gifts from, I mean, it's Catholic environment, so the gifts from God. And then through education or through school years, you have to find it and then you are expected to apply to the, you know, uh, the world after you graduate. So that was the underlying principle. Oh, right. I get that. I mean, we've got a similarity there because I also went to an all girls Catholic school and I think our school motto was to prize what is of value. I think at that very early age, I realized or through schooling that value is not a monetary thing. It's precisely something else. And then you don't even really know what it is. You just know that it's not at all about money, that value comes in different ways. And I think that's without really thinking about it until you just sort of said that and made me think about my own early days at my school, that that was really where it's all come from, right? The value, the value that we both are now having yes. by speaking about our earlier days and what we feel and live as lawyers in Japan. So that's very interesting. You brought that up for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> my pleasure. So what then? You were at the school in Yokohama, but you didn't stay there. I think you also went on a trip to the US. Yes, that's right. So when I was in year nine, I was in a sense getting a little bit bored of attending the same school for nine years straight. Mm. And then I saw a couple of, of older students, what we call senpais, Mm. in Japanese, going off to America or Canada or sometimes Finland using 
certain exchange programs. And having seen that, I just thought, okay, that seems interesting. So I want to do that. And I also have been seeing my father taking many business trips overseas. So I really wanted to see what it is like, what the life is like outside Japan uh, with my own eyes. So I talked to my parents and also to um, to the teachers at school, whether there was any way for me to join that program and then found a way and then did go to Colorado, United States for one year. In my case, it was this organization called AFS. Yes, I've heard of it. Yeah. Yes. So they arrange um, high school students do this exchange program all over the world. And wow. then I apply with essays and CV. After that, I take, um, we take certain exams, which is more like a kind of common, common sense exams across all subjects. And then after that interview and just find out you, whether you make it or not. So you, you had your time in the States. What was that like? It must have been so different to Japan. Yes, it was very different. First of all, I attended a co-ed school, public oh, high yes. school. Oh, yes, quite different. So that is quite different. <laughs> and the other big difference is that at that time, which is 2004 to 2005, Colorado's Asian population was just 2%, which is virtually no Asians. Mm. And I remember I was only two or three agent students out of um, the school of probably a thousand mm. students. So it was a very different environment compared to that Catholic all girls school environment. Yeah. What do you remember then from those days? Did you just, did you feel special? Did you feel too different? Did it make you want to do more to blend in what was the kind of feelings going around then so because there was virtually no asian population i did not stand out in a strange way they just thought that i was just somebody who just moved to colorado like a month ago and at first of course my english was not great but people talked to me because i looked different and asked all the questions about Japan, but also interesting about China, which I don't know much of. But because of that, I was able to make friends right away. Because they asked questions, I didn't have to summon the courage to talk to them. They came it. to me. I so, get it, yes. So in that sense, I got lucky. Right. And then because I'm quite by nature talkative, I want to talk and I love chatting with my friends I just could not bear not talking so that really made me speak English on a daily basis with friends at school and also the other aspects of the exchange year is that I ended up living with this wonderful host family for a year and they helped me demystify the American school system, the or the high school daily lives, and then they talk to me every day. They treated me as if I was one of the family members. So I had great help from both the school friends and also the host family. Fantastic. I mean, I love how you said it was really lucky to be different. I don't think I've heard anyone say that before, especially on the podcast here. I think sometimes standing out and being different can feel quite awkward. It's sort of really interesting that you've made it like a place that you can embrace where people came up to you and it was a a strength that you didn't have to think about approaching others it all came to you and how interesting that is to think about that and pause because that's that's my daily life as well in japan is that i am different so people ask me curious questions and i hadn't thought about it in that way before that it's a lucky thing thank you for that that's really inspiring <laughs> and very interesting Yes, um, but I think some of the friends who ended up, for example, in California, where there is a big Asian population, they seem to have had different experience. So I may have felt lucky because I was one of the only Asians in the school. 
but whereas for them they are part of the big minority groups so i think that had really um different impacts on our on our experience as exchange student mm i get that too and you know you talked about your initial thoughts of being a professional wanting to be a professional who was in service of someone in the world did you find that strengthened while you were in the states did it make it something that you really knew that you wanted to do i'm just wondering here where the law part starts to come into your life because i know you do return to japan and do law right so where's that coming up what's that bit of that story for you so law actually came in after i have come back to japan right so okay. after spending one year in colorado i came back to the same school in yokohama so that was 2000 five summer and after that the infamous competition and then the study period for university entrance exam started and I was talking to my parents which university or which departments to apply and their advice at the time was that because I am a woman their advice was for me to have sort of professional qualification because that would enable me to sort of take a leave from work at some point for whatever reason, for example, giving birth to a child. But having that certification would let you go back to the workplace, not easily, but easier than without any qualification. That was the advice. So I thought about, okay, so what kind of qualification or certification could I get? And from there, it was more of an elimination process, I have to say. I was not good at maths, so I couldn't be a CPA. And I also was not good at all the scientific subjects. So um, the, the medical doctors gone out a window. Um, being a lawyer just was the option that was left on my list. So that's how I got to the and <laughs> to choose this <laughs> all right did you know any other lawyers in your family or friends or you know parents friends at all parents friends yes yeah okay um, they so those lawyers were all men but looking at how they work they had sort of certain autonomy because they were running their own law firms mm. so that was also attractive at that time so it that you don't have to necessarily answer to big bosses in a big corporation but you have your own thing you know what you're doing you can control your business so that's the lawyer mm. I saw indirectly wow okay so you you end up studying law then. yes I did great did you enjoy it um so yes and no that's the right answer I feel for me it's like yes and no I loved it but I didn't like it at the same time tell me yes. more about that for you so Okay, I decided to become a lawyer. Fine. But my first option was to become a Japanese Bengoshi, so Japan Japanese qualified lawyer. So that's how I ended up attending Keio University. But I will admit, as soon as I started studying Japanese law, that was I just did not find it interesting because all I did or I all I seemed to be doing was that I was just reading all the codes and try to learn the interpretation of it. And that just did not appeal to me. So I had really difficult realization the first or second year years of university because I joined the university thinking that, okay, I will become a lawyer after four years. Then that just did not seem a good match for me. So that was a really difficult thing to realize. But around the same time, I have come across this professor at Keio University who was specialized in Japanese and also US antitrust laws. And he sat down with me one day telling me that, Yui, I think you can go to the law school in America. That was then another positive realization for me that I do not have to be working in Japan all my life. I can step outside Japan again this time with a view to be qualified as a lawyer in the US. So 
that's how I come to decide to just skip Japanese law school and then go to the United States. Brilliant. And you did go to the United States. Again, yes. Awesome. And I guess that flipping of the feeling of oh, leaving behind Japan law, so Japanese law, and then taking on US may have been quite a big pivot for you in your brain and your heart too, to sort of think now I've got my way. This is going to be where I want to succeed in the law. And was it like that for you when you, you went to Georgetown, wasn't it? I did go to Georgetown, the master's degree. Yes, I did, um, 2012. And that was definitely the pivot or aha moment. Mm. But getting there, I fought a lot with my parents because that time I did not have my parents' support at one time because that was something that parents did not think of at all. Mm. So it was difficult. I'm assuming to let me go it was a scary thing for me but also for them so after months of arguments they ended up supporting me so I'm really grateful for that how did you win them over how did they win themselves over do you think I think I was too stubborn to be honest good <laughs> yeah right? but I also um, made a case that my English testing score was much better than they ex expected. Right. So I had something to persuade them as well. Right. And that you wouldn't be faltering in the English part of it. You'd be fine. You wouldn't. Exactly. Let, you wouldn't let them down. I think at the end of the day, parents just want you to be happy. Did you stay then in the US for your first sort of role of working there? Yes, but it was only for a short internship. So it was only four or five years after that big financial crisis of 2008 and the legal job market had not fully recovered. Mm. So even American students were sometimes having difficulties landing with a job, especially private practice in the East Coast didn't really have many roles to give away for foreigners. Mm. And of course, I didn't have any green card or any sort of visa. So I did not really make it, it even to interviews. So I struggled with that for a few months while I was doing the internship at Federal Trade Commission. But after all, I made up my mind to just go back to Japan. But in the meantime, this recruiter found me by chance on LinkedIn and he was the one who connected me to Norton Rose Fulbright where I am now today and then so just when as I was making up my mind to go back to Japan things started to fall into pieces. So when you were starting to come back to Japan things started to the pieces came together. Yes exactly. Yeah. How interesting right when you think something's not going right with his Japanese law you head off to the states and things come right and then you are leaving your law studies and you're at the US Federal Trade Commission and it's okay, but it's a difficult time because America's going through a difficult time as well. And then someone finds you and you go into another good channel. Yes. How interesting that your life has gone like that. And then you find yourself coming over here to this great office of Norton Rose Fulbright. And what year was that? 2014. So who was here at that time? How did you get that job. You must have been in the US still. Did you interview in Japan or in, in the States or a bit of both? So I only had the interviews after I have come back to Japan. Right. I had, I think, two or three interviews yeah. with the then um, head of office. Yeah. And it just happened after two or three months. So after that recruiter found me on LinkedIn, things happened quite quickly. How amazing, right? Because some people say recruiters are all over LinkedIn and, you know, don't don't go there. But look at that. Look what happened to you. And that it was really, really great that someone found you and chose you. Why did they introduce you to that office? What was it about you, do you think, that was attractive for the firm here? One thing I can immediately think of is, of course, my language skills. So I speak um, Japanese, which is my native tongue, and I speak English um, at the professional level. 
So that was obviously an appeal to them. And then the secondly, the year I joined Norton Rose was 2014, but the year before that, Norton Rose had merged with an American firm called Fulbright and Jaworski. So they were open to adding US qualified lawyer. So I just happened to appear on their doorstep at the right time. Timing is everything. Wow. Yes. yes. So again, so, I got lucky. There you go. Uh, but from those early days, what's been your journey from then till now? So the first time I joined in 2014, it was difficult because unlike English solicitors, the US law lawyers, US qualified lawyers do not have the formal training years. So I, I joined Norton Rose without any proper training. So I was a proper um, baby lawyer, <laughs> did not have any clue what was going on at first. So that was a that was a real challenge. And also I have to say, I so as a result, I joined Norton Rose at first as a paralegal. And then so that I could start building up my skills. And then at first I was doing corporate m a work and also antitrust work for the first a year or so. And then there was some team reorgani uh, reorganization. And then I ended up moving to the um, banking and finance team in 2016, where I'm, I'm still today. So I have had quite a not straight, um, straight line career progression. I experienced various different things um, before landing this banking and finance practice where I'm focusing today. And, you know, most people would think, Yui went to the States. Why has she not got an American accent? But here you are with this British accent I can hear. So you spent some time in the UK, in Europe, correct? A yes and no. So before Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> well, right now the answer is yes. But when I got the British accent, I had never lived in the UK. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yes. So... When I moved to the banking and finance practice team at Norton Rose Tokyo, they assigned me to sit with this partner who, with whom I still work. And he is this British gentleman. And he just decided, decided to train me so that I speak <laughs> British English. And now I just, it's come out. <laughs> I just went along. Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> and because English is, after all, my second language, it's easier to adjust or like adapt. So <laughs> that's how I ended up getting uh, <laughs> speaking like this and just end up confusing people everywhere I go. You do. <laughs> but in a nice way. I love it. All right. But you did actually go then to London and they would have thought, well, here she is already well versed yes. in the English that we like to speak in England, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I got asked whether I grew up in Berkshire a couple oh, of times. Goodness me. <laughs> Sometimes I just went along for a while as a joke, but um, <laughs> um Well I'm glad you said Berkshire because I remember the first time I said that in England and I said it the other way. Oh uh, right, yeah. It's it because it spells Berkshire. Shire, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah. I, I can remember the day I said that and what the reaction was, but there we go. <laughs> so you were there and then you, how long did you spend in the, in, was it London office? Yes, yeah. I did go to London office in 2019. Oh, okay. But I mean, nobody knew that coronavirus mm. was happening mm. a couple of months down the line. So only three or four months after I relocated to London, COVID pandemic happened. And then I was locked into my own flat without many friends. So it was a really difficult time for me. Mm. And as I mean, everybody in the world had difficult time. But as well as that, I also had quite lonely time. Mm. And I relocated originally to London with a view to um, settle there for a long time. But at that time, we like nobody knew what was going to happen. So I took a somewhat painful decision to come back to Japan to sort of regain some normal normal life. And then so that's um, why I came back to Japan in 2021, summer. What well, makes sense, though, it's something you can control. 
because you can't control all the other stuff that's going on around you. So you may as well take hold of whatever you can. Correct. To, yes. Yeah. To bring some control into your life. So to me, it sounds absolutely normal and reasonable that you would want to come back to your home roots here. Right. Um, right. And be with family, at least to have that comfort in your, what was happening around everybody was just so bizarre and nobody knew what was going on as you just well put it. Yeah. Yeah. So you came back here and now you're, you're working in the office uh, and I guess also doing remote work. But what do you love about the work that you're doing now? Is it fulfilling that original idea, you know, of being professional and being of service to people? That's a good, that's a good point, Catherine. Um, I think the answer is yes. So banking and finance in transaction and especially what I do, which is shipping and asset financing, it's a highly niche very niche area with specific knowledge and skills. So not many people have that. So when they, the clients come to us and ask for help, I'm glad to say that we have the skill set to help them to achieve what they want to do in terms of business. So yes, the answer is yes, that I feel like I can, I can help them in a professional sense and then make their lives a little bit easier. Mm, great. Well, finish the sentence for me, Yui, then. The most important thing I have learned in my career so far in law is? So one thing I have learned from my career in law so far is that when you meet a good person, whether that is a client or boss or colleague of yours, hold on to them and build your solid personal network with them. Ooh, tell me more about that. Yeah, so just to explain that a little bit further, as Catherine was, you were saying at the beginning of this recording, something, success is not necessarily monetary, so it's not how big of a transaction you did. But for me, it's the support network and support network that I have, and also um, working with good people for good cause. And because we meet so many people daily, all year round, you sometimes forget that you met this person or you sometimes don't remember these people. But when you meet a good person, you distinctly remember that. And when you notice that somebody is a good person, genuinely good person, you should not let that go because you never know how I can work with them in the future. I can be of help to them in the future. But in the meantime, they might be able to help you. So it's not like give and take situation, but it just build a organic, holistic network just because it's a nice thing to do. So that was my thinking process when I said that at first. Yeah, I actually got a little tear in my eye when you said that. <laughs> you've really summed up what I think life is about um, and the people that we meet and, you know, saying that it's, it's not about that big transaction that we can sometimes get accolades for. It's how we interact with people, how we look after them, how they look after us. And I think you've really summed that up so beautifully. Thank you for that. And the other thing I will just say, but you also, it's a very fundamental thing, but you also have to pay attention to your health, both mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. And because we tend to have quite a um, busy life filled with professional and personal obligations, your health becomes kind of lower on the priority list, but I don't think that should be the case. So yeah, paying attention to your health is a key important thing, I think everybody should be aware of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also we can't always do that by ourselves, right? We sometimes need help with the physical side of things. If we injure ourselves, somebody usually helps us, but in the mental side of thing and our well well-being, we also often can't do it all ourselves and need to have others help us in that way as well. Absolutely. Mm. Okay. Well, I asked you today to bring an article with you that you wrote for Norton Rose Fulbright's online news channel. I think it was called Re. Yes. Would you like to read that? Yes, sure. Um, 
I would love to share that. What's the title of the article? So the title of the article is I am somebody's wife. Okay. On 19th of July, 2021, the day referred to in the UK as England's Freedom Day, I arrived at a hot and humid Haneda airport in Tokyo after living in London for 22 months. The COVID-19 pandemic with all of its restrictions, as well as other personal reasons, had brought forward my decision to relocate to Japan. As soon as I returned, I started looking for a new home in Yokohama. This is my hometown and I am familiar with the area, and so I expected a smooth transition. After going through a number of difficulties associated with the pandemic for nearly two years, I did not wish to create more hassle for myself if it could be dispensed with. There was one difference about myself as compared to the time before. I am now married. Married to a Briton who has moved to Japan with me to a country he had never been to previously. I arranged numerous flat viewings in Yokohama and all the letting agents asked me at one point or another to refer all future correspondents to my husband. Just to name one of the reasons they gave I was told that the various documents and contracts needed to be reviewed and signed. How did this make me feel? I felt like I was an insufficient constituent and a lower class citizen of the society that I thought was home to me. I felt ignored. I thought I had come back to where I'm from. I thought I knew my way around here. I thought I would be accepted for who I am without reference to my marital status. Now that I am somebody's wife, I can see that my home's community now treats me differently. The cool air of autumn arrived as we moved into our new home. Two months had passed since my arrival at Haneda Airport. I stood on the balcony, grateful for the autumn breeze, and looked at the gantry cranes operating some distance away. And I tried to process the travelling journey, logistically and emotionally. When would it be, and what would it take for me? and other women of a similar social profile to gain a true freedom and be regarded as a full member of the community. If I were never to feel that I belonged to the community that I thought was my home, would I then lose my home? Starting to feel quite overwhelmed, I went inside to make a cup of tea. The end. It's always a cup of tea, isn't it, in England too? (laughs) It is. How to help you through something. It's always a cup of tea. Yes. Oh, goodness yes. me. So you wrote that in 2022. Late 2021 or Late 2021. early 2020. Yeah. Sorry, you wrote that in Norton Rose Fulbright's open intranet. Yes. It's actually open to the public. So anybody can look at that um, on the Norton Rose Fulbright website. Did you get anyone react to that? Yeah, I've written... Um, at least four or five essays like this on that magazine. And yeah, I feel maybe not this one, but for other one, definitely um, some, someone reached out to me to say, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, when somebody say, well, I didn't have um, that kind of experience or somebody say um, I had similar experience. So we don't tend to share this kind of vulnerable moments especially in this kind of powerhouse private practice world. But when I share, people react. So I'm sure that people are having similar feelings or moments with vulnerability. So I'm glad that I share that so that I was able to reach out to at least some of them. Yeah. So what does that article mean to you now? Have things changed since then? Have you found that you're still working on that? I don't think this will change this Mm. issue will change in terms of Japanese society anytime soon. I still have similar experience when my husband and I show up to even like a chat or then people just talk to him first. And I'm just um, just an additional, just tagged along to the meeting. They give him 
the business card, but not to me. So I always have this really sad feeling every time we meet somebody new. Because it's very hard to challenge it in the moment, isn't it? You know, hey, I'm here. I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I, I earn my money. I pay the bills. Uh, I'm a person too. How do yeah. you, what do you do with that? If you can't do it in the moment, is there some way you can work on that? So when, bit bit, yeah. when they don't, for example, offer me the, the business card or handshake, I just stay persistent on the spot and then like, I just give my business card so that they have to give me the, their business card. Yeah. So in that moment, just at least one person may have a um, different view or different thought process after that. So I'm trying to make a change on the spot to the extent I can. Right. Is there any other way that you're doing that too? I think giving your business card in that moment is, is absolutely the right thing. And yes. it must make them think, oh, okay. Right, I see. And not assume perhaps some people will react to that and change their behavior after that. We we would certainly hope so. How else are you doing that? Because I know one thing I wanted to talk to you about was this pamphlet you got in the in the mail as well. And I think that ties into you declaring and trying to change things. Yes. Yeah, so I am a member of the Kanagawa Prefecture's Gender Equality Committee since last year. And they lay out Kanagawa Prefecture's gender equality targets and also planning every five years. And then last year was the year to come up with the, the, the next five-year plan starting this year. So discussing those gender equality targets and what kind of society we want to make within the Kanagawa Prefecture, that's our rule. And then we, recommendation, we make recommendations to the Kanagawa prefectural parliament to help them understand what the issues are within the constituents and what changes um, we want to see in terms of policy, in terms of um, new mandates, um, just to name a few. What have you been able to add into those policies to try and move that needle forward on the things that you spoke about in your essay? So when I interviewed to be on this committee, I told them that this gender equality committee should not just be focusing on the issues of men versus women. If they are saying that it's a gender equality committee, then they also have to make sure that people of all genders, however they define themselves, they have to be um, looked after, they have to be included, they have to feel that they belong to the society. So that's what I said at the interview. And at the time, I had not known, but the existing committee members took the steps ahead already and included the, those kinds of um, all gender inclusive policies in the, the new five-year plan that's starting this year. So I felt like I pushed and I added the voice that this all gender perspective is absolutely necessary in the recent years when considering like any gender issues um, nowadays yeah very good and how many people are in this committee are you the only woman or are there other people other genders involved in the committee as well yes um so there are uh, 11 mm. committee members mm. and out of 11 two are men and the rest are women Mm. So I think I would be happier if I see more more male committee members um, on Absolutely. this, to be honest. Absolutely. Because we can't ignore the fact that still most of the uh, most of the positions are taken on by by men. Yeah. So we have to have their support and allyship to make any changes happen. Exactly. And I think perhaps you told me that the way that you came to know about this committee was there, a, there was a flyer that came in your mailbox. Correct. So maybe you could do another flyer that says we need male allies to come and join our committee. We would love you to join because and give them reasons why. Maybe yes. that's something to do. Mm. Yes. And then the, we talk about the quota system in terms of bringing more women to workforce or the managerial positions. But 
on the committees like this, we also should have, in my opinion, a quota system for men as well. Absolutely. I hear you. I'm I'm fully in agreement with that. Yes, we, we talked about that at IWD, right, International Women's Day event last week even. Yes, um, we did. We did, but I think you're right. We need our male allies on these committees as well. So there's a shout out there for anybody who's living in Kanagawa area in the prefecture there where is Yokohama is based, right? Uh, yes. To come on board this committee. Is there anything else there that you want to say? I mean, you express some such vulnerability with that essay. I really feel that there's something there in what you could do in the future to do more of that. And perhaps you'd encourage others to put their hand up to write these kinds of articles, tell people about it, um, even in their companies, maybe be an entrepreneur and start up that kind of creative writing forum for others. Oh, that's a good idea, Catherine. What do you think? I think, yes, that is actually an interesting way to share stories. Because one thing I was thinking of saying is that these days we see so many success stories on the media whether that's the traditional media or social media we just see so many people succeeding and then we don't necessarily hear about their failures or their weaknesses or their vulnerable moments and then that at least to me was very intimidating as if they just were successful from the get-go which is never the case. So I think people should share the story and then how they have overcome their difficulties or their vulnerable moments and then how they got help from other people and then it is not wrong or it is rather the right thing to get help from other people. So creating those kind of environment where weakness is accepted, I think that's that's what we need in this sort of machismo culture that's I think what that's missing Mm, so is and I think you're absolutely right there where you see someone with their success and you don't know how they got there you just see them as successful and you're judging yourself by their success whereas there are so many more steps ahead and have definitely stumbled absolutely stumbled there's no way you get to be successful without having fallen over and that's so true and I think we need more of those stories and maybe we can think more about that after this, how we can try and encourage others to speak up in this way um, and tell their stories. I would also encourage anyone who listened to Yui just now and heard her speak in such a vulnerable, vulnerable way about what happened becoming a married woman, that you go on to the site and you find the other articles. We will also list them in the show notes. There's one particular one I also love about what it is to be a Japanese woman. Um, oh, and thank you for reading that. That one really sang to me. Um, and we can talk a bit more about that another time. But I, I encourage people to do what Yui's done. I mean, show your vulnerability. Be a place where others can come to you because of your vulnerability. And I'm sure others will from now, um, if they haven't already been doing that, Yui, come to you for... Uh, your mentoring and your insights into the way that they can overcome these things that you have struggled with because certainly you're bright and cheery now and I know that you still carry these vulnerabilities but uh, you are helping others to tackle them as well. I very much hope so. Yeah so for young lawyers let's think about them we're talking about uh, vulnerabilities and people coming up through the ranks I would say advice for young lawyers what do you think would be some good advice that you could give to them. Perhaps it's around what we've been speaking about, but you may have a piece of advice for them to offer up as they're thinking about their law career in Japan. I would say that um, be open to opportunities that will come your way, even though that opportunities may not be what you have thought about or planned for that might be a good match for you. And those opportunities normally are presented to you because somebody thought that 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 would be a good fit for you. I know that many young lawyers today have this wonderful plan talking to many people in advance, but still, when you're presented with new opportunities, just be open to it because that's, 
I suppose, how I ended up going to, first of all, Georgetown in DC, and second of all, landing with a role at Norton Rose in 2014. And neither of that was on my initial life plan. Mm. But both of those options just turned out to be a great fit for me. It was scary, I would not lie, but I'm glad that I've taken up those options. Absolutely. And for that, we're so glad that you are now here in our community and, and making a difference. Is there something else that you might say specifically career advice for any other women lawyers? Just be stubborn. Like um, <laughs> like me presenting my business card to those who are not giving them to me first. Just keep offering your business cards. I am a strong believer in the small actions. So giving one business card to one person just in front of you, it's just a small action. And then probably it won't make any difference today or tomorrow, but you never know how it will pan out. Maybe that person has a daughter and then maybe that person will think differently about daughter's career in the future. So uh, some people I think call it a butterfly effect, but just be persistent, keep, keep making small changes whether or not that would result in anything big anytime soon. That I think I would I would be happy if anybody joins me in that. Yay. Yes, indeed. And the other day when we were at that event together, there were three people who did not have a business card, Yui. And right. they said they were an exchange student or they were still on, only a law student. You know, the word only or just should be eradicated from our language. Uh, and I said, no, just go and get one made. Just put your name on it. Tell people who you are and have something to give to others to tell them and have them remember you. I, I said, go and do that. That's your mission for the next week is to go and get some cards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, be stubborn. I am a law student. I'm studying this. I'm a future lawyer. Right? I don't write that on your card. And someone said, oh, could I do that? I said, you can do anything. <laughs> yeah. Future lawyer, right? Imagine receiving a card with that on it. You'd be just, you'd never forget that person. So exactly. Be stubborn. I love it. Well, let's wind down with a, just a, a few questions on a lighter note uh, to wind up the episode. So, one question I have for you is what's your favorite Japanese food and where could I get it from in Tokyo? Oh, my. Ah, oh, gosh. I don't know what my Japanese favorite Japanese food is. Oh, come on. <laughs> oh, but I put this um, on one of my, the Norton Rose Re Magazine article, Eating Out in Yokohama and Tokyo. But there is this really old um, rice cracker or senbei store in, I think that was in Ueno. Mm. And oh my, their appearance is just as if they just reappeared through a time machine it's really old small but once you go in they have I think not hundreds but they have so many different kinds of rice crackers and then they somehow managed not to raise their price Whoa. so you can get really nice Lovely. rice crackers for for example like 50 yen or something it's just Goodness amazing me. amazing sounds amazing yeah I'd love to go there that's so cool. And I was going to ask you the place in Japan you'd recommend people visit, but maybe it's there. Maybe, yeah. yeah. That's um, not touristy. Yeah. But um, you can see more casual sides of Tokyo, not the flashy new, new side of Tokyo. Mm. What's one of your favorite sayings in either English or Japanese? Something that you like to say as your kind of mantra? Ever since I came back from Colorado, I always tell myself when I'm panicking, just believe in yourself. Like, you are fine. Believe in yourself. That's what I always tell myself. Absolutely. I hope you've got that written on the wall in front of you where you work and where you play. That's a brilliant. Yeah, just believe in yourself. Awesome. Is there something, Yuri, that you've read recently, a book or something that you've listened to, podcast that you would recommend? Okay, so... I have two. So podcast, this is more like a cheerful one, it's nothing serious. Um, Ladies Who London. This is a podcast run by two of the London Blue Bats tourist guys. 
and they share really interesting historical hi- history and anecdotes, oftentimes focusing on um, female figure and focusing on various historical sites in London or wider England. This is a very um, lighthearted but very well put podcast. Love it. I've written it down. It's on my list. Yes. And the uh, the book that I'm reading right now is called Woman and Family in Contemporary Japan. This book explains how women and also mothers' role is um, expected to work out and then what role a mother is expected to play within the family and also within the um, society. This book explains that first from the historical point of view and then second through various interviews with I think about 110 women. It's interesting to look at that from a foreigner's perspective, because I think it's written by an American lady, American professor. Mm. So it's very interesting to see that, um, how that's perceived by so-called Westernized. Awesome. We'll put that into the show notes as well. That sounds like something to put on my very big growing list of (laughs) books. And last question is something about you that a lot of people don't know. Okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. I am um, not ashamed. Arashi fan? Do you know Arashi, Catherine? (laughs) I do. Didn't they disband? They're the boy band. Yeah. Um, They (laughs) they are on hiatus right now. Um, But I have been, yes, I have been their fan for more than half my life. I mean, yes, this is (laughs) this is what another different aspect of me, people. And I know you like running marathons too, which is just astounding. So, right? Oh, yeah. I don't do marathons, but yeah, I oh, run I, I run as long as uh, half marathons. Oh, it's half marathons. Okay. Yes, so yes. two of those together is a marathon though. Yes. Yes. But I, last year uh, in the year 2022, I ran a total of 1,015 kilometers um, across the year, and then which is worth 24 marathons. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever run to an Arashi concert? No. <laughs> Maybe that's a thing to do in the future. Maybe. Oh, that's so awesome. Well, Yui, we've come to the end of our chat today. I've really enjoyed having you on the Lawyer On Air podcast. Thank you so much. And it's been just amazing to connect with you in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It was a um, great pleasure to explore our lives again. Yes. And so for listeners who are interested in connecting with you and learning more, can they reach out to you? Where would it be the best place to do that? Oh, yes, of course. Um, Please do get in touch with me via LinkedIn. Lovely. We'll put that in the show notes as well. So for everyone listening, if you've enjoyed this episode and it's inspired you in some way, please do subscribe and also share it with someone you think would be inspired to hear the stories that Yui told us today. You can also go over to my website and leave a comment there. A voice message is also possible on my website. So please do that. And that's all for now. For today, I will see you on the next episode. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. Please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I invite you to connect with me to talk more. Jump on over to LinkedIn or Instagram where you can find me or send me a message via my website contact page. That's all from me today. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer On Air. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now.